I think we, as conservatives, need to advocate a compassionate agenda to social problems that begins with supporting civil society rather than imposing government knows best cookie cutter <coughs> solutions on our society. Thank you. So now we go to the open debate, and we'll start with Mr. Nelson. You'll be happy to know that I, I have nothing to add uh, to my friend's points. Everybody should be really happy to hear that. I think we're in violent agreement. <laughs> well, speak for yourself. Um, no, I, I certainly agree. I mean, both both uh, both Jason and Byron have made very good points, and, and certainly one that I also agree with very much with, with Jason on, and that is, in our communities, the people on the ground, the people closest to the problem, they understand it best. Government should facilitate and assist with their work, and not pretend that it knows how to impose solutions better than the people on the ground. Thank you. Uh, question number four. Do you believe the Alberta government has a spending problem, a revenue problem, or both? And what strategies would you use to address the mounting debt? And we'll start with Dr. Sturkey. The age-old economic and fiscal debate of our time, do we have a spending problem, a revenue problem, or both? Well, we have a spending problem in this province that first needs to be addressed. When I was in business for 30 years, and at times we would go through periods where our revenues would decrease. I would always look first to the spending side of the ledger. But I would always look at the spending side of the ledger in areas where I knew we could make reductions in our expenditures that did not compromise, in my business's case, patient care. And that meant I didn't cut staff. That meant that I didn't cut the hours of our operations. I made sure that our core business model, providing service to our customers, was there and it was always there and that it was high quality. But what I was prepared to look at is every line of service that we provided as a clinic. And as a government, we have to do the same thing. And in some cases, we have to make incremental reductions or hold the line on expenditures, which is a way to eventually bring the budget back into balance. And sometimes we have to decide we shouldn't be in this business at all. We should not be in the business where private industry is providing the service, for example, for hospital laundry. That we're spending $200 million on and we don't need to. We should not be in the business of purchasing private uh, you know, diagnostic labs. $50 million being spent on that. So these are the kinds of things where significant reductions can be made. So my concentration would be first and foremost on the spending side of the ledger to hold the, hold the line and reduce costs wherever possible to bring our budget back into alignment and so that we're no longer borrowing money to pay for everyday expenses, which most businesses that I know of, if they did that on a long-term basis, they would very soon be out of business. Thank you. Mr. Kim. The NDP is adding nearly a billion dollars to our province's debt every single month. $30 million a day. Think of the sacrifices that we Albertans made in the 1990s to eliminate the largest deficit in the country, to eliminate our province's debt that allowed us to bring in the 10% flat tax and create the Alberta advantage to set us up for a couple of decades of prosperity. And now they're washing all of that away. But we also have to take some responsibility here because Alberta government spending has been growing faster than population growth or inflation or, or economic growth since the, in the last 13 or 14 years, since the end of the Ralph Klein period. One of the reasons why half of the PC parties, traditional voters, donors and activists left it is because it was no longer a fiscally conservative party. And uh, so we, we need to admit that this province has been spending beyond the means of taxpayers. It is a spending and not a revenue problem, as Jim Dinning said in the early 1990s. It, we are spending 20% more per capita than the average amongst Canadian provinces, 25% more per person than the Liberal government of British Columbia to deliver effectively the same services at roughly the same quality. In fact, in some respects, like healthcare, they have better outcomes at substantially less cost. If we were spending just what, it, what BC is on a per person basis, we would be spending $11 billion less. Guess what? That's the deficit. 
We would have a balanced budget if we were simply as cost efficient as the liberal government of British Columbia delivering a full spectrum of social services. Now, can we reduce spending by $11 billion overnight? No. We have to do this very carefully and prudently and gradually. I led two huge Ottawa departments that reduced their operating budgets by 10% without causing any political ripples. So this can be done, we did it before, and we can do it again. Mr. Ness, I'm glad the question was asked the way it was, whether we identify Alberta as having a revenue problem or a spending problem. And I can tell you as someone that's, that's raising children and going to work every day and doing normal life stuff, I don't have any more to give. So we better bloody well not have a revenue problem because there's only one pocket that it comes out of and that's each we have our own pockets, but each of us have a pocket and that's where the money comes from. Uh, you know, with what Jason alluded to, I agree between, I mean, the, the numbers show, between the year 2000 and 2010, under our watch, government spending doubled. Now, those were very good years. We all remember that was a pretty good decade. But what that led was to an increase. And I can bet that nobody in this room had their family spending double between 2000 and 2010. Uh, if you did, good for you. But I doubt there's too many that have. We have such an administrative bureaucracy. Everybody that's a conservative fiscally like I am thinks that we have too much. We can cut back on bureaucracy, but I do think that. And any study shows that we have too much administration bureaucracy within each department and within Edmonton itself. Uh, I'll give you an example on healthcare, so I hope I'm not cutting off a question that comes down the road. But we have the Department of Health under the ministry. And we have an organization called Alberta Health Services. Those are the two health delivery systems that were set up. The health, AHS was set up under Stella Max Watch. And by the, by the creation of that, there was an immediate duplication of bureaucracy overlapping between the two organizations. To this day, that bureaucracy has never been eliminated. Getting back to Dr. Starkey's point, I know in my business, if I did that, I'd be in big trouble. So that's where we start, and we have to remember that we can cut back on that level on bureaucracy administration immediately to reduce the amount that we spend. Thank you. So maybe not so much a rebuttal, but some time for additional remarks. Well, exactly. Certainly, uh, we need to be very careful and very prudent and cautious. And, and certainly, one of the things that resulted in the loss of confidence in our government over the last number of years has been a loss or a lack of fiscal discipline. And I recognize that as a fiscal conservative, as a business person, I recognize you have to pay your bills. And the problems that the current NDP government is giving us with unrestrained borrowing, with constantly raising the debt limit, these are well known. And so as a government, we need to be able to demonstrate that we can make the difficult decisions but we need to make these decisions in such a way that we do not adversely affect frontline service delivery. That's absolutely critical because if frontline service delivery is impacted negatively by the spending cuts that have to be made, then those, those reductions, those decisions that we have to make will be opposed by, by Albertans and they should oppose them. We have to do it in such a way that we don't compromise the delivery of essential frontline services. Thank you. I agree, but we can't buy into the NDP's fake political discourse, this fake choice between fiscal responsibility and uh, the delivery of key uh, frontline services that people depend on. If the Liberal government in British Columbia can get better uh, health outcomes in most categories than we do, for 25% less per person, then the problem isn't BC, the problem is Alberta. And uh, we, we can't buy into this, you know, this scared, fear campaign run by the NDP's special interest group friends who, who think there is a bottom lip pit of tax dollars that they should get access to. They think money grows on trees. They don't understand that the way you can be a caring and compassionate society, the way you can have um, generous healthcare education and infrastructure is by creating wealth in the first place. And you don't create wealth by penalizing wealth creators through high taxes. So we have to get back to our Alberta advantage, which is wealth creation first, and then we can share some of that wealth uh, with those who need the help. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, I'd add on that uh, point that Jason was just making. In 
one of the phrases that I use in my campaign here is called creating Alberta as a land of opportunity again. And I say that my family came here because they thought they would do better, and they did. And we've been very lucky and very fortunate to have been here for the last five generations. My children are the sixth generation. Along the way, we lost track of that. We got away from remembering that Alberta should be and is the place where you come to work hard and take risks and achieve rewards. We got away from that and we started reacting as a PC party government to a number of things. It doesn't mean we need to ditch the party, it just means we gotta remember that we should be the land of opportunity once again. And when you do that, when you create a climate for businesses, for people to move here from other places as traditionally was the case, you increase the tax base. We all know that. That's a way to deal with this. We can talk about, I've talked about cutting, but that's an additional way to solve our budgetary woes. That's going the wrong way for the NDP. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Well, thanks, Mark. I just want to say a couple of things. I'm glad that Jason pointed out the excellent health, health outcomes in uh, British Columbia. The health minister in British Columbia is a veterinarian. Uh, he went to, uh, went to vet school with me. Now, I don't want the front page of the Medicine Hat News to say Starkey advocates veterinarian health care for Albertans. <laughs> so let's just be really clear on that. But there are principles and there are things that you learn from running a business, running specifically a veterinary health business, that are applicable in terms of how savings can be found without compromising patient care. And you know, one other thing I do want to say that is critically important, and this is uh, something that I learned from Chief Louis of the First Nations at Osirius, and that is, it's the economic horse that pulls the social cart. And as a veterinarian, I happen to know that if that horse is lame, that horse is sick, that horse is not in full strength, you can't make the horse better by loading up more stuff on the social cart. So let's be very clear that we're able to provide our suite of social services in this province because of strong fiscal capacity. Thank you. Mr. King. Yeah, just to amplify the, the same point. So the NDP increased the highest marginal income tax rate. The federal liberals did the same thing. And our, our highest marginal growth rate went effectively from 38 to 49%. So guess what? Thousands of very successful Albertans are now leaving the province. They're reestablishing residency elsewhere, and they're taking with them 100% of their taxable income. When they raised the corporate tax rate, what, did, what happened? A bunch of businesses closed and relocated to other provinces and jurisdictions, or, and or to the United States. So raising tax rates does not necessarily generate a proportionate amount of increased revenues. In fact, revenues are down under this NDP government that has raised rates. They're killing the goose that laid the golden egg which is the spirit of enterprise in this province. So no, we don't have a revenue problem, we do have a spending problem, and we need a little bit of courage, a lot of prudence and compassion, but also the kind of courage that the Klein government demonstrated in the 1990s that set a pattern for the rest of the country. It demonstrated that politicians could make tough decisions and be thank rewarded you, rather thank, than punished by voters. <laughs> Mr. Nelson. As we continue to uh, restate the same point and agree. I'm going to tell you a little story, and, and that's that my healthcare video on my website at byronforalberta.ca demonstrates that we pay the most per capita in healthcare of any province in Canada, by some measure. We pay about 33% more than the national average per capita, but our delivery, although good, is about average. We're not getting a bang for the buck. So I often make that point and say, we can trim, and when we were in our Edmonton debate not too long ago, uh, I emphasized this point, and a point like this in the debate, and I said, what, you know, what, I've had hospital visits myself, and I've lost my father. When you're in for treatment at a hospital, it's not a bureaucrat or administrator in Edmonton that's treating you, or your father, or your family, or your loved one. It's someone in the hospital, and I said, we gotta cut healthcare, but we cannot cut those frontline workers. And the next day, the, excuse me a second, the next day, the NDP did a press release about me saying, that's code language for cutting frontline workers. Thank so you. let me tell you, there's no winning against these darn NDPs. <laughs> next question, it, again, it is multi-part, so you can attack it from a number of angles. Uh, question number five. Each of your plans has risk that could hand the NDP another turn. <coughs> Albertans want to know if the rebuilding will take too long and cause vote splitting. 
Will the united right leave a large, unrepresented center and force them elsewhere? What if both conservative parties don't agree to merge? And we'll start with Mr. King. Well, but both of my colleagues here have questioned whether uh, creating a big, broad, uh, sensible free enterprise party is doable in the amount of time available. So our leadership election is on March 18th. The election is legislated for May of 2019. I'm proposing a timeline that gets us to a to reconstitute the party that we lost, that fractured right down the middle, that rec recreates that coalition um, uh, through an agree first of all, an agreement that is then ratified by members, hopefully, through a grassroots democratic referendum, then setting up a new party, a big founding convention that defines its constitution and principles, and then electing a leader by about a year from now, so a 10-month process, effectively. We did the same thing federally in 10 months. Across 10 provinces, three territories, two houses of parliament, two official languages, 10 times more people and a lot more complexity. So if we did it there in 10 months, we can certainly do it here. Federally, as Stephen Harper was elected to lead that coalition in April of 2004, Paul Martin called an election just six uh, weeks, weeks later. We almost won that election federally, and we won it huge in Alberta with 65% uh, of the vote in 26 of 28 seats. So this is eminently doable. It just takes a degree of imagination and confidence and hard work. It's, but since when are we Albertans not up for a little hard work? Uh, now, th th if we do this, we will eliminate the problem of vote splitting. And if we look at the results of the federal conservative government party since the merger in 2003, it has won on average 65% of the vote and over 90% of the seats in Alberta. Why would we not try to recreate the same coalition here? I don't, it, it, it's a big, broad coalition uh, that has won over 90% of the seats in five successive federal elections. It worked. It just requires a bit of hard work and a bit of a willingness to compromise uh, and recreating the coalition that we used to have in this province for four decades. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Nelson. Well, I often talk about the myth of the vote split here in the 2015 election. It was a weird election. Uh, I was a candidate there in Calgary, a place that you'd never imagine. The NEP never got more than 200 votes before, I think, in the history of that riding. Um, I went to the doors every day. I talked to 10,000 doors, 8,000 phone calls, knocked on 10,000 doors. And, yeah. So I didn't talk to the doors as much or else they would have locked me up. Uh, they didn't until I made it to the end of the campaign. But people were either pro-PC or anti-PC. And if they're anti-PC at the beginning of that, of that election, in that area, they decided that they were gonna vote Wild Rose. And then when clearly the Wild Rose's message wasn't working, I could feel it, you could feel it when you door knocked. Anyone that door knocks knows that people are talking. You could feel people shying away from the Wild Rose, and I thought, great, because there's vote splitting. They're gonna come back home. And no, they shifted across to the NDP. So there wasn't vote splitting, so we're trying to solve the wrong problem. And I, do this quickly, but I want. I noted that I looked up the numbers. Medicine Hat, the PC vote went from 5,300 roughly to 3,400. The Wild Rose only decreased 200 votes. The NDP vote in the last election was 1,000, went up to 6,100, and we saw that across the province. That's not vote splitting. That's a message that worked. That's a competent party, unfortunately for all of us. But I, I want to say what happens here if, if we merge. And I'm not offended by the concept of merger. It's just we go through this process that I was part of federally. Uh, I think it was eight years total by the time you had the United Alternative and the Canadian Alliance, and I even went and worked for a day or two on, on Stockwell Day's campaign and realized it wasn't a party for me. And Eventually the short strokes were done in eight months, and that's fine. But here, we have a party, we can't merge. What we would have to do is shut down both the PCs and the Wild Rose and create a third party. We have nothing in our constitution that allows us to shut down. We never contemplated it before. The first time that we can amend our constitution is next November, a time by which Brian Jean has magically said, will be too late to talk merger. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've been very clear on this from the outset, and that is that the five-point unity plan would not work. And I've outlined specific reasons, most specifically, that there isn't enough time to get it done and that it is simply too risky. Now, I really didn't expect that I would get an endorsement of my criticism of that plan, but last week it came for Brian Jean. What we have essentially is Brian Jean torpedoed the five-step unity plan. I'm a veterinarian, I know the plan is dead on arrival. 
That plan will never come to fruition because the Wild Rose has already set out a long list of stipulations whereby the only way it's going to happen is under Wild Rose terms, Wild Rose principles, and under the Wild Rose party, and they will concession, have a concession that they'll let us keep our name or at least half of it, which they've already registered. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the danger of applying what has happened federally to provincially. And we've seen this before, and it is a danger that we must not fall into again. The rules at the federal level are different. You are not allowed to merge parties in the same way in Alberta as was done federally. And we know, for example, that there's a different dynamic at play in Alberta. We have to recognize that. We also have to recognize that the federal party merged lost the first election, then the next two elections managed to win minority governments, and then finally, for the fourth time around, won a majority that lasted for one term. And now it is in opposition once again. Compared to that, our Progressive Conservative Party won 12 consecutive majority governments. I'll tell you whose record I support, I'll tell you whose record I think is more sound for Albertans, and I'll tell you whose record I think makes more sense for Albertans going forward. We'll have opportunity to discuss some of the other issues that come up here, but in my view, this is honoring the opinions of our party members to rebuild and re-energize the Progressive Conservative Party. the opinions of grassroots members, then why isn't he prepared to let grassroots members decide in a party referendum? That's the principle of our campaign. It's to take power away from the leader and the executive and to give it directly to the grassroots members who can accept it or reject it. Why would you be opposed to that unless you're afraid they don't agree with you? I happen to believe the reason I did that I'm doing this is because I heard from an overwhelming majority of Albertans reflected in recent polls that show three quarters of grassroots PC voters want us to pursue unity. This party has had too much top-down arrogance, too much of telling people what to think. It's time to invest the decision in the hands of the grassroots. When we did this federally, it's true, the Joe Clarks, who we hear the echo of in this party today, said no. They were amongst the 8% of PCs who said no. 92% said yes. And Richard, we won all of those campaigns post-unity here in Alberta with over 90% of the seats and two-thirds of the vote. Thank you. Well, I hate to be the historian here, but I'll remind everybody that last May we did go to our grassroots members of our party and vote at our AGM on whether to rebuild or consider merger. And speaking of 92%, I think it was 98% of people at that AGM voted to keep rebuilding the PC party. And that doesn't have to mean that the, that doesn't have to mean the topic's closed forever. You know, a healthy party listens to its members, listens to the Alberta people. But right now we're facing an NDP government. And the election is not necessarily May of 2019. It's March, between March 1st and May 31st of 2019, if Rachel Notley doesn't call it early. I tell you what, I'd rather get working on nominations on March 19th than faff around for two years with an unwilling dance partner who has re-clarified twice in the past seven days that they have no interest in merging as equals. Let's not give Rachel Notley a free pass. Let's build Alberta's greatest single political party and win ourselves in 2019. Well, Byron, of course I completely agree, but I truly object to the statement and the notion that somehow I'm not listening to the grassroots. I went to constituency engagement sessions all across our province, none of which Mr. Kenny attended. I was at the AGM that voted, as Byron said, in favor of renewal and rebuilding. In fact, five of six people that ran for the uh, leadership were there. Mr. Kenny was not there. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Quebec referendum. We'll just keep asking the same question over and over until we get the answer we want. At some point, you have to move forward. As I used to tell my veterinary students, at some point, you have to make a diagnosis. Otherwise, the patient's gonna die of old age. We have to move forward. 
we made a decision last May, and five of six leadership candidates made it very clear that, that was the, the respect, they were respecting that decision, a decision of grassroots PC members. So I respect those who were involved in those engagement sessions, and uh, I think uh, you said last time 2,000 people and the few hundred people who voted at that uh, uh, AGM, including supporters of mine who thought the renewal vote did not preclude unity. But there were one point, uh, there was 410,000 people who voted for this party who weren't involved in that process. This party at that time had a few thousand members. When Ralph Klein and Ed Stelmack were elected leaders, it had over 200,000 members. So I think we need to open up the doors and talk to the grassroots, not the hardcore activists only who are important and, 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 and whose commitment we value, but to the ordinary, and Ralph Klein used to call them the severely normal Albertans, people who don't show up at party conventions, but they have every right to have a say on the future of this province. And three quarters of them are telling us to get this right, not to risk the future in terms of a second NDP term, because of a decade of division, they're telling us to move forward in the future with confidence. I think we should let them decide. And historical clarification, there was a thousand people at last, last May's meeting. For what it's worth, it was an important building block following the May 5th, 2015 election. Uh, I'm not against referendums. They're not very, they're not something that's done very often. They're very expensive. Important issues we can have referendums. I want to understand, I want to be the guy, the voice of reason that says, there's nothing in our constitution that allows referendums. And the leader is one vote on the board. Those hardworking volunteers that have kept this party going since inception, but certainly since May 5th, 2015, outvote the leader approximately 49 to one. So there's no magic path here. By the time we got a referendum, we'd have to amend our constitution move forward, get a referendum in a year, year and a half, and let me tell you, one of my many superpowers is predicting the future. And I can tell you that Brian Jean's gonna say by then, boys, it's too late, the Wild Rose is running 87 candidates. <laughs> well, I, I really have to object to some of the characterization of some of our, our people. Some of the people that kept this party alive during its darkest days after the May 15, 2015 election. Did our membership numbers drop? Yes, that happens when you lose an election. That's an experience we haven't had as a party for over four decades. But I'll tell you what, you find out very quickly just who your friends are. And you can call them elites, you can call them hardcore activists, they're the people that pound in the signs, knock on the doors, make donations, and kept this party alive. They are the grassroots. They are the people to whom we owe the fact that this party is still in existence and that we can participate in this leadership contest. And I believe that the opinions and the decisions made by those people, made by over 1,000 of them in May, in Red Deer last year, should be, must be respected, and that we must move forward with the direction that they clearly demonstrated to us they wanted to see going forward, rebuilding, re-energizing, and refocusing the Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta. The GSAs and choice in education. And we'll start with Mr. Nelson. Yeah, this is something that comes up universally at these debates. Uh, again, you've asked a three-part question, so I'll do my best within two minutes, but I, I wanted to, I ran out of time there, I wanted to, to acknowledge, we're talking about the foundation of this party, and I know Jim Horstman somewhere is in the, in the house. And we talked about people that worked really hard and made life really good for my family, and I hope I didn't lose too much of my time in talking about an important subject. So I'm gonna talk about parental rights out of that first. Um, Bill 10 was a little bit of an ugly chapter in our government's history. Uh, because of the way it was rolled out. It was part of what I say was a problem of how our party had disconnected from the people. I think ultimately we got somewhere near where we should have got by the end, but it was an ugly rollout and it caused a heck of a lot of infighting and a lot of pain within. But I wanna talk about parental rights because I'm a parent of kids that are in school and I'm public about saying that my kids are in public schools. But I believe that a parent is the person that should make the choice and is the best person to make the choice on whether that child goes to school in public, in private, homeschooling, 
or charter schoolings, we have quite a few of those where I'm from in Calgary. A parent is the right person, and they, if they make that choice for the best of reasons, they're the ones that should make that call. Um, I emphasized this point when we were in Edmonton in the debate, and I got into the issue of parental rights, and I was told uh, afterwards, someone made a comment, to suggest that parents don't have rights. And as a parent, that rubbed me the wrong way. And as a lawyer, I looked up, and, and just to clarify, the United Nations has indicated that parents have rights. Uh, the Alberta Bill of Rights, which is just a piece of legislation, it's not something like the Charter, says that parents have rights. And I believe in the parents' rights to be the single most effective choice for schooling. And also to be informed and advised of when controversial subjects, as the father of a now teenage girl, I like to know when my, my daughter's going through human sexuality classes, is what they call them now, so I can at least have that conversation. I don't think that makes me extreme. I have the right to decide and be, t be notified of what my children are going through. Well, we'll start with Bill 10. I supported Bill 10, as did all but two legislators in the last legislature. All but two supported Bill 10. With regards to GSAs, GSAs save lives, full stop. GSAs give students a safe and caring and inclusive environment within their school. And, you know, you can look at the statistics. But unfortunately, LGBTQ kids are massively overrepresented amongst our young homeless. They are massively overrepresented amongst young people who commit suicide. And we need to make sure that we have the supports in place. And GSAs are one of the most effective ways to have that in place. And I'm a strong believer that GSAs, where they are requested by students in a school, should be made available and that the students should be able to meet on school property. Finally, with regards to parental rights and parental choice, well, I've spoken on this on four separate occasions in the legislature. I have defended choice in parental education mostly because I, or at least my family, was a homeschool family. We have two sons, we were blessed with these boys, and we homeschooled them K to 12. Now, our oldest son is now a Master's of Theology student. Our youngest son, he's a political scientist. So, we've got covered off both the sacred and the profane. And I think that means we've got the whole, uh, the, whole, the whole gamut taken care of. But I defended it in the House. I defended it against NDP members like Brian Mason, like David Egan, who would have us limit the choice of parents. I believe that one of the great strengths of Alberta's education system is the fact that we have choice. That we can choose charter, independent, or Catholic, or public, or, or uh, homeschooling. These are all strong choices, and depending on the child, and every child is different, they're not made all the same, folks. Every child is different. Every child should have a chance to succeed, and that's why I believe in parental choice. Mr. Kenny, I think one of the greatest legacies of PC governments in this province has been the legacy of school choice, the uh, tradition and the system of uh, allowing parents to choose what makes most sense for their children, uh, a legacy developed in large part by the Getty and Klein governments that allowed for funding and fair rules for uh, charter schools, for great diversity within the publicly administered system under the public boards, both uh, separate and, and uh, public, and of course uh, for independent schools and for homeschoolers. And th let's make no mistake about it, this NDP government is ideologically hostile to school choice. If they have their choice, and if they get a second chance, if they get a second term, I have no doubt that they will seek to impose upon us a, a government knows best, cookie cutter approach uh, to education, that they will remove public funding of and impose unfriendly rules, hostile rules to the operation of independent charter and home schools. Uh, and so we, that's one of the reasons I believe we need to unite to remove the risk of an NDP attack on school choice, which they've already given us a bit of a tell on recently with their uh, shutdown of the largest homeschooling board in the province, the Trinity and Wisdom School Association, which was repudiated by a court of law. I also uh, believe that parental authority in education is, is primary. It says it in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, that parents have a prior right to direct the education of their children. I recently met, uh, and we need safe, of course, school protocols that treat uh, children safely and respectfully, but the government shouldn't be standing in between parents and their children. If they're abusive parents, bring in the uh, in social services, bring in the police if necessary. But government should not be 
precluding parents from knowing what's going on, loving, caring, compassionate parents from knowing what's going on with their children. And unfortunately, some of the NDP's rules do just that. I think that's an overreach. We need greater compassion. Allow parents, teachers, and principals to sort this out on a case-by-case -case oh, basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Chance for rebuttals or further remarks? Yeah, this will be the further remarks, not the rebuttal. But, you know, the NDP has been clear, and it's been fun joining or traveling around the province with Dr. Starkey, where he talks about his own homeschooling experience because the NDP approaches homeschooling. And I'm not a homeschooling parent, as I said, my kids are in public school. But the NDP approaches homeschooling as if it's a bunch of crazies, right? Who else would homeschool their kids? And, and, and not having Dr. Starkey's experience with my own kids, I know that I have a cousin that was homeschooled in Calgary for a simple reason, because when he was in public school, he was severely bullied. And we all know that bullying can get quite bad, and my cousin was one of the worst. Homeschooling was the right choice, and his parents made that choice, in my view, quite legitimately. Parental choice in schooling has to be and is the most important thing that we can preserve. Thank you. Dr. Well, certainly in addition, and that is, you know, uh, one of the first speeches I gave in the legislature had to do with the Education Act, and it was right after Brian Mason said that our government had folded to a fringe group. And the fringe group that he was referring to was home educators, was home schoolers. As you can imagine, I, I got a little hot under the collar, and I let Brian Mason know what I thought. And I've been letting the NDP know what I think about these issues ever since. And I defended homeschool as a choice, as is all other parental choices. But, you know, I, I, I just like Jason, maybe you could answer. You seem to be very proud of a lot of our legacies. You're proud of our school choice. You're proud of the legacy of the Alberta Advantage. I'm going to assume that you're proud of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund. I guess I'm curious to know that if you're proud of all these things of the Progressive Conservative Party legacy, why are you advocating a pathway that would destroy our party? Well, Richard, I'm not. I'm advocating a new start and a fresh beginning for a party that was massively rejected by voters, which has lost half of its support base for a reason. You know, when we created the Conservative Party of Canada, we didn't lose the best aspects of the legacy of the Conservative Party going back to 1867. In our caucus off room, when I walk in there every week, uh, as uh, what I did as an MP, you would see John A. Macdonald and John Diefenbaker. The legacy continues, but it continues with renewal. To suggest that a party should be immutable, should never change, uh, doesn't reflect reality in a modern society where we embrace change. We did that federally, we kept the legacy intact, uh, but we, we made it relevant to uh, contemporary political challenges. On the question of education, I just want to add this, I'm deeply concerned with the NDP's pending radical changes to the school curriculum. One of the stated goals of which is to turn students into, quotes, effective agents of change. I happen to think the school should be there to transmit the knowledge and skills, Thank not you. turn kids into political Thank activity. Thank you, Mr. King. Just to be the room's historian one more time, the uh, curriculum change was started under the PC party, and it was because one of our other great legacies, in addition to being the single greatest party ever created, uh, serving this province and my family so well. But we, we started reviewing the curriculum because it was time, and once in a while you have to update this. And When my grandpa was alive, he would go on and on about some curriculum change that happened in the 1960s or something, or 50s, that caused him consternation for the rest of his life. But that's what we do, and we can evolve. I certainly agree with Jason that we don't want to turn, I don't want my children to be turned into militias, uh, militants and army soldiers of the left. But it's okay to review our review in it, as Jason says, a constant changing world, it's okay to review our curriculum from time to time. Well, Byron is quite correct with regards to the issue of the curriculum review. It was initiated, and I mean, the, the impression the NDP gave was as if we had stopped ever reviewing the curriculum in our province, and of course that's simply not true. But the curriculum review that is underway right now is one that all Albertans should be concerned with. First of all, because when they initially rolled it out, the NDP said that they would consult teachers and educational professionals. There was an area mention of students or parents. 
we have a role, of course we do, and we also need to make sure that there is a role for all sectors of society, the business sector that will be hiring our, our, our new graduates as well as other sectors including the nonprofit, and yes, trade and labor unions, they're all part of a functioning society. But to suggest that one group or another group should not have a place at the table for something as fundamental as curriculum review is wrong, and I encourage all people in this room to watch for the results of the curriculum review panel, Give your comments and make sure that the, this government is heard with regards to your opinions. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Well, one of the fundamental problems is that this re review is being done in secret, behind closed doors. They won't release the names of the people being consulted. We could be pretty sure that the NDP's preferred ideological special interest groups are writing this curriculum with no input from parents. Uh, and listen, call me skeptical, uh, Byron, but when socialists say they're doing radical curriculum reform designed to turn students into effective agents of change, I'm pretty confident they don't, they don't mean better numeracy or literacy or standardized test score outcomes or greater knowledge and skills. I think they're headed in the direction of more pedagogical fads and political agendas of which we already have enough in our school system. Sure, if we need to update uh, elements of the curriculum, that's fine, but don't do it in secret, and please don't let a socialist government do it. Thank you, leadership candidates. Technically, he named me, but that's okay. Question seven of 14. Again, a, a multi-part question. Uh, so the, the rules, I just said the rules set up. Uh, question seven. Uh, again, a multi-part question, and again, uh, you can attack it from a number of angles. How would you earn back the trust of rural Alberta around the issue of property rights? And do you believe property rights should remain under provincial jurisdiction or under federal control? What is your position on Bill 6 and WCB for farm workers? Dr. Starkey. Well, multi-part is right. I'd like to have two minutes for each of these. Well, let me say, first of all, with regards to property rights in that issue, this was an issue that our government handled badly. And it was a big part of the reason why we have lost a lot of support and a lot of trust in rural Alberta. And that is also why I'm going to suggest respectfully that of the three candidates on stage, I'm the only one that can win back that trust. Because that's how you have to do it one by one, member by member. And I understand the property rights <coughs> issue. I know that there have already been made improvements made. We have to continue that process. Specifically, we have to address sections 11 and 18 from Bill 36. We have to make the necessary amendments to make it very clear that property rights are vested in Albertans. With regard to the question of should they be vested federally or provincially, well, that one's easy. Peter Lougheed won this one for us against Trudeau the first. I'm not about to give property rights to the federal government with Trudeau the second. Our best defenders of property rights is our government right here in this province, and I believe that any attempt to water down or remove property rights by a provincial government will be opposed, and you know, quite frankly, we've already seen that, and I respect that. I respect that because these are the people that provided me with my living for so long. Now let me move on to Bill 6. Bill 6 isn't about farm safety. That's what the government would like to tell you. I stand, stood on the front steps of the legislature and I reminded the people, and I reminded specifically the bureaucrats, that from my experience, cows calve on weekends. They calve in the evening, and yes, they calve on statutory holidays, and they don't get time and a half to do it. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, the solution of the NDP bureaucrat, which was to just pull, put the bull out in the daytime so that the cows calve in the daytime, is not going to work. <laughs> I oppose Bill 6 at every step along the way. I will move to repeal the vast majority of Bill 6 with one exception that I'll have a chance to talk about probably during the rebuttal phase. But Bill 6 is bad legislation. It won't make our farms sit. It won't make our farms safer. Okay. And in fact, it's something that I oppose consistently. Thank you, Dr. Stick. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy. So on, on property rights, uh, I think property rights should be included in the federal constitution. It's the paramount law of the land. No. It's a fundamental law that belongs to all Canadians, and it should be defended by Alberta as well. One of the reasons why the Wild Rose Party got uh, uh, half of our traditional supporters created their own party, especially in rural Alberta, is because of land use bills brought forward by recent PC governments that many people in the agricultural sector saw as compromising uh, their inherent property rights. 
without guarantees of due process and compensation. And we need to, we need to listen to those folks and ensure that we review those bill, those statutes uh, to ensure uh, that they respect the principle of property rights. So uh, while it's an academic question, I would be all for property rights recognized in the charter so that they are justiciable, so they can be enforced by the courts, uh, but also to uh, more deeply reflect that principle in Alberta legislation. Uh, I would also repeal, repeal Bill 6. Uh, this uh, was designed by and for the NDP's uh, big government union friends, not by and for our hardworking farmers and ranch families. I recently met a third generation Alberta beef producer up near Grand Prairie who's selling their herd and their farm in large part because of the regulatory burden and the costs associated with Bill 6. Uh, that is going, uh, he just said that the uncertainty, the uh, potential sanctions are just too much for them to bear. An entire dream, three generations of work and sacrifices vaporized because of this bill. I don't think they even know or care about that in the NDP government. So uh, we do need to re re repeal Bill 6. Uh, there may be, as Richard says, small elements of it that uh, we need to carry forward, but, but not the framework of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Yeah, just to start off with the issue of, of property rights in the Constitution, it's something that was debated uh, through the eras of the Charlottetown Accord, uh, that sort of time frame in the early 90s, and it certainly comes with its hiccups. Uh, with our property rights issue that Jason's referring to, where we lost a lot of support in areas like this under the Stillmat government, was because, as I recall and as I understand all these years looking backwards, is because we really took away the comfort uh, and the ability of the landowner to have access to the courts, to be consulted, and to have due process in the hearings. Those were sliced right up. It was a ridiculous decision that in most part managed to get fixed after the fact. But we can look back uh, and say that is not one of our good legacies. It was ill thought out. And even the fixes that were done under the Redford government weren't enough. All we should have, as long as the province has the, per the property rights, all we should as a landowner is be, be able to be informed, take part of any process of accessing our land, and certainly be properly compensated if access to our land is required. So that's that, and, and Bill 6, I'm the first uh, generation of my family on all sides that's, that's fully off the farm, meaning I, didn't, I wasn't born on the farm, my parents have left the farm. Uh, you know, I see, I see Bill 6 as nothing other then, and I think my friends have alluded to this, nothing other than attempt to bring unions onto farms and ranches in Alberta. Uh, I've got many relatives in my family and still farm and ranch. And it was couched in a way of protecting children after a fairly unpleasant disaster that occurred on a farm in Alberta. But it's absolutely ridiculous, needs to be repealed. You cannot tell me, and, and, and I appreciate that that they did after bringing the bill in, actually consult with some farmers and ranchers, nowhere near enough. Uh, but we can repeal, keep some sections of it, because farm safety is important, but we don't want to hurt the, the family farm any Thank worse you. than it's already hurt right now. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Rebuttal and further comments, Dr. Stern. Well, while I grew up in the city of Edmonton, I consider myself a proud rural Albertan and I represent a constituency that is both urban and rural. And I can tell you I had the privilege of working with farmers and ranchers for most of my career, so I understand the concerns that they have. Now, I will tell you first of all as to where property rights should be vested, absolutely not with the federal government. Absolutely not. Peter Lockheed fought long and hard to make sure that relationship was guarded. Secondly, with regards to Bill 6, I promised I'd tell you what I would keep. Well, I wouldn't keep it really. What i do is I'd change it as I made an amendment in the legislature. And that was give employers and employees the choice of either taking WCB or some form of private insurance, but ensure that every employee has some form of coverage to cover them against the event of an injury or tragically a fatality. That is something we should all do. And you know, when you talk to employers and employees, they agree with that. They don't have a pro problem with that part. And that is the one part of Bill 6 that I would retain with amendment. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kim. Well, I agree 100% with, with Richard that property rights should not be enshrined with the federal government, the point of the rights is to protect people from the government. It should be enshrined in the supreme law of the land, in my judgment, so it is fully enforceable. Alberta has a constitution in name only, the Alberta Act, which can be amended by 
a simple majority vote in the legislature. The, the charter is enforced by the courts and can protect people from overreach by the federal government, which is why the Conservative Party of Canada has had a policy uh, to enshrine in our constitution uh, in a way that is enforceable property rights. But the bottom line is, this party in recent governments got offside many rural Albertans who believed that legislation was adopted that violated the sanctity of property rights. We need to listen to them, we need a proper solution. Obviously, um, municipal and provincial government uh, need a, a general framework for, for land use, uh, but one that does not in any way violate the sanctity of property. Thank you. Mr. Nelson? Yeah, just on the first point there, the Charter has an amending formula that we all know is very complex, so yeah, it's not going to have a question. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to talk about that here. But again, as I said, one thing we have to remember about rural Albertans right now is the population of rural Alberta is declining. We've talked and we've toured around rural Alberta and we've talked about different ways to fix that. There's healthcare ways, certainly the digital divide between rural and urban are important issues. But Bill 6 isn't gonna help, right? Jason told one story, there's lots of stories about farms and ranches giving up after multiple generations. Not in my family, thank goodness, we live, we farm east of Calgary. We've been able to survive this. We've survived other battles. But let's remember when we deal with this, it's great to say, let's make farms safe in that phrase, but let's not make it bloody harder to run a farm or a ranch than it already is. Thank you. Thank you. Well, final comments. First of all, once again, and I'm gonna say it again, I'm proud to represent rural Alberta. But I will tell you that I will fight for rural Albertans throughout my career, but not just because it's good for rural Alberta, it's because when rural Alberta succeeds, all of Alberta succeeds. And I saw what the Romano government did in Saskatchewan through the 90s, shutting down rural hospitals, shutting down rural schools, and that affected Saskatchewan very negatively, their population declined. We don't want to go down the road with this NDP government, and I will defend rural Alberta. I'll defend rural Alberta against Bill 6 as I did in the legislature, and I will also defend rural Alberta against the carbon tax, which is which is significantly harder on rural Albertans and gets significantly less benefit back to rural Albertans. We're not going to have public transit. We're not going to have an LRT that runs from uh, from uh, Hussar to Jem anytime soon. And this, these are the kinds of things that you know that the carbon tax is supposed to fund. It is a huge slush fund on behalf of the NDP. Much of the funding is being provided and taken from rural Alberta and will be channeled not back into rural Alberta but into the NDP's pet projects, that is not something that is healthy for Alberta as a whole, and it certainly isn't helpful, helpful or healthy for rural Alberta. Thank you. I share Richard's passion for, for rural communities. I grew up in a prairie village with a population of 256 people, and I saw the struggles of keeping rural communities vibrant and alive, uh, and that, that is why I think, as Byron has said, population is a critical issue. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to pursue is using the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program to focus pop it on immigration, permanent residency immigration, to rural communities. We have, quite frankly, uh, enough people in Edmonton and Calgary with populations of a million or more. We, we should prioritize uh, immigrant opportunities in smaller communities uh, to help stabilize and grow their population. And I'm also quite concerned about redistribution of uh, the boundaries, electoral boundaries in Alberta. Uh, the, I'm concerned that the NDP, if they have their way, might end up eliminating six to eight of the 24 rural ridings of the province, further reducing the voice and weight of the of rural Alberta in the legislature. I think we need to be very careful before we do that. It could deepen tensions between the urban and rural parts of the province. We need to ensure that rural Albertans have a strong voice in the legislature. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, do you have any final comments or final comments on this issue? Pardon? We're on final comments. One, one yeah, no, I think these two thought that this was final comments. They, they lost count. These oh, two I'm thought it was final comments on this issue. I'm sure they have different things to say than what they just said, so perhaps just give me a little grace and I'll do a brief answer to this and I will uh, I will not hold my friends to the rules of this debate. Yes. Uh, um, so if that's okay, yes, I'll, that's give a, okay. I'll give a brief answer. A, uh, 
I, uh, you know, as the historian in the bunch, I read the rules. I listen to what the moderator oh. says, but you know, my friends don't always do that. Um, but that's okay. So let me talk about a separate. Uh, let me talk about a separate issue of a rural, uh, and I want to talk about rural health care. Uh, that sort of it doesn't lead into Bill Six, doesn't lead into property rights, but it talks. Seeing as we're on an extra answer, um, rural health care is an issue in, within the declining population that's keeping people from staying in rural Alberta. Standard of living in rural Alberta, I've heard many people tell me they think it's different than urban Alberta. Healthcare, digital divide, things like that happen. But we have a very exciting time on our hands here in 2017 and beyond when we can actually provide medicine by video link with a nurse to someone and save everybody from having to drive into major centers to see specialists for what would be considered routine. That saves a lot of kilometers on everybody's trucks and means you pay less carbon tax, which is a good thing. <laughs> okay, moving on to final comments. Uh, this is two minutes, and you can use the podium should you choose. And, and we will start with Dr. Sturkey. Well, thank you, Glenn, and your team, and thank you to all of you. This has been a wonderful evening. You know, Alberta is a very special place. As tourism minister, I welcome visitors to our province, and they always told me, you are so lucky. And they were right. You know, but I learned a long time ago not to rely on luck. Alberta, this incredible place that we call home, is hurting. And Albertans are hurting. Now, low commodity prices are one thing. We've experienced those before, but what we haven't seen is a government that seems oblivious to the hardships of Albertans and instead has embarked on their own voyage of political self-discovery, taking us along on what has been a very rough ride. Albertans have had enough. They want leadership. And even with all the challenges we face, I still believe in Alberta. I believe that we can recreate an economic environment that welcomes investment instead of scaring it away. I believe that we can put people back to work by restoring stability and certainty for the business sector. I believe that we can further diversify our economy by building on the strengths that we have in the oil and gas sector, but also in petrochemicals, agri-food, forest products, and biotechnology. I believe that our dedicated healthcare professionals can trans transform our province from simply responding to illness and injuries to focusing on preventive medicine to keep us healthy and out of the hospital. I believe that we can educate our young people in safe, inclusive places to succeed in an ever-changing world and that their research and innovation can solve mankind's greatest challenges. I believe all these things. Above all, I believe Albertans will embrace a vision of optimism and hope. All Albertans, from our indigenous peoples that first inhabited these lands, to the successive waves of courageous settlers, to the newcomers we continue to welcome today. All are looking for leadership, and they want to elect a government and a leader that articulates that vision. I'm Richard Starkey, and I want to be that leader. This magnificent province is under is being jeopardized by a socialist government that doesn't understand it, that's doing great damage to our economy, that is destroying jobs and hope and businesses and enterprise every day through an agenda that has no regard for its consequences, that is pouring fuel onto the fire of one of the worst recessions in our history. We cannot afford to, to risk the future of Alberta. If they get a second term, they will change not just the structure of our economy, but our political culture, but uh, who we are as a province in ways that I think will be catastrophic and irreversible. We need to give hope to Albertans. We need to bury the hatchet, to focus on what unites us and not what divides us, to learn from the mistakes of the past without getting trapped in the past, to honor what's best about our legacy, but to embrace a new beginning and a fresh start. The vast majority of progressive conservative voters are telling us to do this. The vast majority of Albertans are telling us to do this. In, the last, in 2015, 1.2 million Albertans voted for the unhyphenated Conservative Party of Canada that was created as a result of a merger 
uh, and versus 400,000 who voted for the Progressive Conservative Party. It's time that we listen to them. It's time that we listen to voters here in Medicine Hat. It's unbelievable that a socialist MP was elected even though 56% of Medicine Hat voters voted for free enterprise candidates. We can't allow that to happen again. So I'm just asking us to try the path of unity, to reconstitute the coalition that we had here, to create an Alberta version of the Saskatchewan party, a provincial version of the Conservative Party of Canada, a contemporary version of the coalition that gave good government to this province for four decades, but ultimately to do so by investing the decision in tens or hundreds of thousands of grassroots Albertans. The decision should belong to them. It's about their future, and with their support, we will renew this province. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. I'm going to talk with the microphone because it's an important issue, and I want to talk about why I'm not interested in merger, why I'm not pushing that forward. Uh, there has been a suggestion that it's some sort of elite reason that elites want to stop the parties from merging, and I want to say for clarity that I'm, as a longtime volunteer in this party, I'm running for a party for leadership that comes with no salary. So I'm obviously not a leader. If I if I was. I'm waiting for my check any day, Catherine. That'd be very nice of you. Um, but let me tell you, in 1965, my parents got married. This is why I'm anti murder 1965, my parents got married the day after my dad graduated from SAID in Calgary, and his entire class in electronics couldn't find work in Calgary. So they had to leave to Ottawa and work there. And fortunately, I was, my parents made a round way, and they got back to, after my sister, myself and my sister were born, they got back to Alberta, and thank goodness I was able to ra be raised here, I was able to live here, and I was able to pursue my career here where my dad wasn't able to. I have two kids, and I worry right now that my kids will have to leave Alberta, like so many others are, in order to pursue their profession and their dreams. And that's why I feel it's so important to me and my family that we never have an NDP government again. And I know both based on my experience in this party and my experience as a lawyer, that there is zero chance that we will come out of this process that's proposed with one single small C conservative party. That is a dream that is a bridge too far. And that's what it is. So I say, what's the best way for my kids to be able to stay and make their fortune here? And that is to rebuild the single greatest party that's provided so much prosperity for this province rebuild the Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta, and let's beat the damn NDP when we get out of office. Based on these final comments, I'd just like to thank the candidates, the volunteers, and all those who took time out of their busy schedules to, to attend tonight's debate. It has been a privilege to be part of this, as one of these individuals could be Premier of Alberta in 2019. I will now turn it over to Sierra for the closing statements. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to use this podium, but um, <laughs> I'm going to thank you guys all again for taking time out of your night. I know we went a little bit over schedule. Um, so thank you. The candidates quickly are going to go into a media scrum here right away, but if they have time afterwards, they are going to be out in the lobby. So feel free to take a couple minutes. Um, Jason did say beforehand that he is willing to stay for whoever wants to talk. Um, so thank you again. Thank you to everybody who helped out. Thank you to our leaders. And if you've had anything to drink tonight from beforehand, make sure you get a safe ride home.